Okay, good morning. Uh, again, this is Adam Goldstein from the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York. Uh, we want to welcome you to today's webinar. Just a few notes before we get started. If you have any questions, please submit them at any time through the question box and they'll be answered at the end. Uh, also a reminder, as a result of the COVID crisis, we've created this webinar series, which is going on for some time now, to bring educational content in this remote working environment. We're always trying to continually enhance this program so we're, we ask that you complete the survey, which will come up at the end of the webinar. Uh, we value your input and try to cater these sessions to what you, our membership, is most interested in. We'll be sending out an email with a recording of the session as well, with a link to download the presentation at the conclusion of the webinar. If you're interested in uh, talking more about what you're about to hear, please let us know, or from our financial economist, Brian Jones, uh, or our in-house uh, head of LIBOR transition, LIBOR, um, Ray Shinazuka, uh, he did the webinar last time, and uh, we've had a couple dozen members reach out to us to continue the dialogue. So uh, we encourage you to do that if uh, the live work transition is, is, is of importance to you. Uh, we also encourage you to check out our financial intelligence library, where there's a, a lot of information, podcasts, uh, articles that uh, are very timely and pertinent to what's happening in the market. Um, also, that page is, uh, on that site, there's a COVID-19 information page, which has dividend announcements, a PPP collateral eligibility, and all of the grant programs that we're doing for our um, housing and economic recovery uh, programs to support our members during this difficult time. Um, very important note uh, before we get started also is that we have uh, recently announced that our new secondary market outlet for members, the Mortgage yeah. Asset Program, or MAP program, is set to launch later this year. Uh, through the month of July, there'll be a series of webinars designed to educate members on the highlights and benefits of the program. Uh, these webinars are separated into two sessions targeted to those who are not currently participating in MPF, as well as the ones that are participating. So for the, if you are an MPF participant, uh, you're required to uh, work this transition and we wanna make it as smooth as possible for you. So please, uh, Feel free to join for those for those uh, um, sessions. Now I'd like to introduce Tom Satino, our Vice President, Director of Member Relations, to tee up uh, today's discussion with Dr. Tom Parliament, who is a very, very, very longtime friend and colleague uh, of mine and the Home Loan Bank staff. And uh, I think you are uh, in for a thrill. Uh, there's going to be this is going to be a very entertaining uh, kind of uh, presentation uh, from Dr. Tom, and I'll I'll let uh, Tom Satino take it from here. Tom. Hey, thanks, Adam. Yeah, I think the membership's definitely in for a treat uh, with Tom Parliament uh, conducting the workshop today. But um, I want to introduce Tom Parliament. He's a good friend of mine and, like Adam said, of the Federal Home Loan Bank of New York. Uh, I met Tom around nine years ago now uh, during a strategic financial planning workshop he and his colleague Janet Lockwood were conducting for our members back in Syracuse in 2011. Um, they've been uh, conducting these workshops uh, dating back to 2007. So many, many workshops uh, have been conducted uh, by Tom and Janet. Um, so uh, when I first met Tom 11 years ago at that workshop, or excuse me, nine years ago at that workshop, I really liked his approach to teaching. He has a real passion and excitement for finance and banking. And uh, I could really pick his brain and get, and get a lot of useful information from Tom. He always, always readily shares his inf information with us and the members. Um, he has uh, some great out-of-the-box thinking and a lot of unique ideas, which I'm sure he'll be sharing with you, us today. Um, Tom's career um, uh, in banking, economics, and finance uh, goes back many years. I used to be a professor of economics at the University of Wisconsin. I know he's been consulting with uh, banks and credit unions for decades, which he still does today with some of our members. Uh, and he also uh, ran a bank in Illinois for many years, uh, but that's behind him now. So um, Tom is... Um, uh, solely focusing on uh, being consultant. Uh, also, uh, another little bit of information, Tom used to be a scuba diving instructor uh, at one point during his career, so I, I find that interesting too. So lastly, um, if you ever run into Tom, uh, ask him about his childhood in Hell's Kitchen. He grew up in Hell's Kitchen, New York during the uh, uh, mid to late 50s, and I find that very interesting. He has a lot of great New York stories to share, uh, to share with you, so uh, and unique perspective on the city at that time. So I found that uh, interesting as well. So I, I think you're in for a treat, like I said. I'm gonna turn it over to Tom now uh, to present lending in the midst of a perfect storm. And uh, he's gonna share uh, some uh, lending ideas and loan pricing ideas. So with that, Tom, are you ready to take it away? 
Hey, hey, Tommy DS. That's what we used to call you. <laughs> New York City. Thanks, Thanks Tom. people. I, I, uh, this is interesting. Uh, I have shepherded uh, with my wife our kids through remote learning in uh, in the last three months of last year, and I do not. <laughs> I, I mean, this is it's it's tough to be on the receiving end of this kind of information, but. We'll give you plenty of uh, opportunity to interact. Now, first thing I want us to remember in this uh, lending in the midst of a perfect storm is I want us to remember that the context of a loan decision, that is the current environment we're lending in, does not change the analytical tools required to make the loan decision. Yes, the pandemic has impacted the economy and the society. In fact, the very institutional framework through which economics is played out is under stress. I don't have to tell any of you uh, the, the, the uncertainty still in the public sector market and teaching and, and um, firemen, policemen. I mean, un until the, the finances of the state are settled with all the ex extraordinary expenses of COVID, we don't even know if people who have been employed for 10, 15, 20 years will have a job um, or will be, will be impacted by uncertainty. So that's the context we're in. But the elements of cost and risk in the pricing of loans, the elements of interest rate risk, option risk and liquidity risk, credit risk and operating expense, these all remain relevant, but their relative importance will change. Furthermore, it's the regulatory context for economic institutions that remains a paramount consideration, specifically capital adequacy and the necessity of stress testing of capital. Now, I know you might think my discussion in the next 40 minutes is guided by my time as a professor of finance or my years as a consultant, but it's not. It's primarily influenced by my seven years from 2011 to 2018, serving as the president of a $300 million community bank, trying to dig itself out of the last economic collapse fighting to keep afloat an institution that had three and a half percent tangible capital and a 15% non-performing loan portfolio. And, and this, this is why it's important because I had to fight to get the regulators to understand what I was doing. The regulators changed every other year. I had to do stuff myself I couldn't afford consultants, and I had to still keep lending and keep deposits flowing. The very problems you're facing now, I learned more by having to do them with my own fingers in the dirt of operating than anything I ever learned uh, in, in an academic context. So everything I'm, I've developed here and I'm talking to you about is really hands-on stuff. Now, let me move this. Uh... OK, now, so what is the case for lending? At the margin, you still need to grow as long as the incremental income associated with lending is equal to or greater than the incremental cost of operating your financial institution. Then you lend. Now. I know there's tactical decisions being made now about potentially shrinking. I know that with the, what appears to be um, very low rate environment and the non-existent almost investment yields and problematical loan yields, that you can lower your rate and maybe deal with shrinking as a tactical situation. In some cases, tactically, it may pay to shrink, but it's not a strategic option. It's not a long run option. 
So it's something that while tax we might do for a few months, we, we clearly are in a situation where we have to be thinking about strategically how do we continue to grow the institution. The marginal benefit to reducing the rate, and it does help to lower total cost. So at the margin, you could get a reduced cost enhanced income. But, in, and I, let me say this now as a little advertisement from my partner, Jen Lockwood. She'll, I mean, she'll be talking about this in a couple of weeks about uh, managing deposit flows. I'm not gonna go into it too much, but I am, I want people to consider as they consider potentially, you're gonna lower the rate now and the funds aren't going any place. They're still flowing into your core deposits. And so you're saying, well, I might as well lower the rate and get the marginal benefit of lowered rate. Absolutely. I would be doing the same thing. But think about the following things. First, while the cost of funding goes down, what is happening to the structure of your funding? I mean, so now it, you get core deposits piling up. But as, and what is their duration? That is, what is the average life of these core deposits? I, I know that, that we're used to having a, a decay rate applied to these things. But I remember arguing with my regulators in the late 2000s about the surge balances they assumed were in all my core deposits saying, well, they'll go back out again. Now, it turned out with a lot of analysis, it turned out the structural change in the industry led more liquidity being demanded and people were willing to pay for that liquidity. And now in a low rate environment, there's gonna be the same questioning of what is the duration, what is the decay rate? What is the credit you get for core deposits? in terms of an interest rate risk management position. And all I'm suggesting is let's remember that that structure is gonna be subject to regulatory scrutiny, unfortunately. And if you do push sort of to the point of shrinking, shrinking your retail base, what is happening to relationships? And third, remember this, asset cash flows that are coming off the balance sheet good yields right now will be going down you will be losing the yields associated with those cash flows and therefore net income even with the marginal benefit of deposit cost reduction so i am i'm, I'm very skeptical that while tactically shrinkage may play a temporary role depending on a situation you structurally and strategically need to be considering increasing the case for lending and that's what we're gonna talk about. All right, let's get this thing one more. There we go. Now, first things first, developing a minimum acceptable loan yield. Mally, developing a minimum acceptable loan yield using an approach of risk and cost adjusted pricing. First thing I want you to do is identify the loan. We're gonna price an individual loan here. I'm gonna be doing a 15 year fixed rate residential. But I, I can do this with any law, any resident, it doesn't matter whether it's commercial or whether it's consumer, doesn't matter. Any, any kind of loan can be done the same exact way. You identify the type of loan with its maturity and repricing characteristics, along with specific credit risk components and the operational servicing costs to go along with that loan at the margin. I am pricing loans at the margin, not an entire portfolio, but as I make loans day by day, I'm pricing my loan. Now, obviously I'm pricing potentially on a weekly basis, uh, and, and, and but, but every loan is made on a standalone basis. So I, I just want you to be thinking about, well, let's price the loan. Now, the first thing I want you to do is determine the mathematical duration of the loan. That is the economic value of the cash flows associated with the loan. Now, this, why this is controversial, I have yet to figure out. I've written articles on duration based pricing for ICBA, for the AB, ABA, for credit unions, did, did it for the FHLB, New York. And, and I still have people when they comment on the articles, like they get other professionals out there, consultants, et cetera. Uh, and they say, well, this is a, a risky way of doing it. And I'm thinking, well, how could that be? This is exactly the way securities markets price bonds. What's the 
asset, what is the present value of cash flows? That's all we're doing here for crying out loud. Even when you price impaired loans, if you've ever had a paired loan, an impaired loan, and some of you, all you probably have one or two, you've had to do the present value of cash flows under gap accounting. So the, the present value of cash flows, you're not strange to this. Well, that's all we're talking about here. We're saying, look, the contractual term of a loan has very little to do with the exposure of the institution to interest rate risk and therefore the price of the assets cash flow. That's all, that's all this is. So I have a little table here. I mean, if you want to think of weighted average life, I know that the FHLB has some analytical software where they talk about weighted average life. Maybe it's easier for you to think in terms of <clears throat> weighted average life. That's fine. But it, it's really the way in which all professionally all securities traders, that's where they trade, they do this. So for instance, if I'm thinking about a 15 year fixed rate mortgage, that's all that is, is a, the amortization term. That's all that tells me about that, okay? What is the true exposure of the cash flows on a present value basis from interest rate risk? Well, you see over here, there's a little determination of prepayment risk. What's, what is the CPR? What's the expected prepayment? That's going to matter because mortgages have option risk, uncertainty in cash flow. Most assets can have that uncertainty, but certainly mortgages do because they're generally made for a longer amortization term. So I'm looking at a 15 year amortization and I see that if I have even a, an expected 6% per year, I mean, people, <laughs> they move, they retire, and they die at a 6% rate. I mean, it's not unusual to say a regular mortgage. People say to me, well, one loan is going to prepay or it's not, but a bundle of them aren't. And, and there's a probability that even if you, that you're going to be one of those prepayments, the cash flows do prepay. And that's the case, look, at 4.8 years. Now, there's a function of the coupon and the loan and the, and the ramp at which you see prepayment because for the first three years, they don't prepay. Usually, though, in the last few years, I've seen loans prepay that were made a year to 18 months ago to get current rates. That, that'll shorten the average life of the loan. So a 15-year fixed rate mortgage has the characteristics of interest rate risk of about five years. You're making a five-year loan. It's a commitment of fixed rate of uh, present value of cash flows of five years. The volatility of the asset value of that mortgage is about five years. Now, it's important to, to get a feel for this because this is going to create the basis for pricing the bond. So let me move on from this. And let's see here. Okay, now, this is the center of everything. This is the matrix that I use. This is not, there's nothing magical about it. All I'm going to do is say, let me see what the wholesale equivalent, what is the bond I would buy? I'm making the assumption that my approach has always been the institution is going to reinvest incoming cash flow. They're either going to buy a bond or originate the loan at the margin. So one of two choices. I actually could shrink. Well, that's a possibility, and I already addressed that. But if, if you're going to reinvest cash flows, you got only two things to do with it: is buy a bond or put it in overnights, or make a loan. You're doing this on a daily basis. A decision is made on a flow basis. Now, there's a reason for the layout you're seeing here, and my focus on itemized risks and costs. This is for the regulator. People. If I learned one thing in struggling, literally struggling with the regulators over a six year, eight and seven year period was anything that's not written down, anything that's not explicitly put in my law, in my, in my, uh, my minutes for ALCO, into my policies, into my procedures, they ignore. So I am, I, I'm overly cautious in making sure when you, when you say you're doing a risk and cost adjusted pricing, you show them what you're doing. It may not just be this basic. 
you may have a loan pricing model, although trying to walk a regulator through a loan pricing model where all the inputs are put in outside your institution becomes problematic because they think someone else is doing it, not you. So now remember, when I did this myself, this is my baby. I had to do it in a way that I could I couldn't go to a consultant. I couldn't go say, well, I'm spending hundred thousand dollars on a loan model. Let's check the loan model and see what it says the, the yield should be on the loan. I couldn't do that. So here was my way of saying to the regulator, I am giving consideration to the risks and costs of making this loan. Because I was making, I was I had to lend, I had to lend in the commercial market, I had to lend in the mortgage market, I had to make consumer loans just keep going i had to replace the loans that were rolling off with new loans even in my condition didn't matter so what i have here is a wholesale equivalent i got the overnight rate if you're going to leave it overnight if you're going to leave it someplace just simply pure liquidity saying well i don't know what i'm going to do with this money i'm just going to it's rolling in i'm just going to put it whatever that rate is is it five is it ten i mean are you getting any more than that uh that's for you to determine on an individual basis what you're getting for the FHLB overnights, or, or do you have a, an ability to make get fund, get funds rates? What is it? So that's the overnight risk-free yield. Now, this is where duration comes in. Where is the matched duration treasury? I'm assuming the treasury is the risk-free investment alternative. And when I did this just a, a few weeks ago, the five year was out of 34 basis points. I know it's incredible, isn't it? By the way, people say to me all the time, uh, just as an aside, we'll never be able to do this in a negative rate. If we ever go below zero, we'll never be able to do this. Oh, blow me. <laughs> right? right. The, uh, if you had a negative rate and it became less negative, you still have a positive yield. People. Okay, so don't let that freak you out. This works. It doesn't matter what the rate environment is. In this case, 34 basis points, I'm not really overwhelmed. But that's the no risk here. That's it. Five years of interest rate risk for 34 basis points. I mean, okay, that's what it is. I, remember, I'm pricing these loans on a daily basis. I can't sit around and question, well, you know, maybe I should wait a while and the rates will go up. Maybe the bond will eventually go up here in a few months and I'll be able to, and meanwhile, I'll lay around liquidity. That's just a fool's game, people. You've got to make these decisions to implement your cash flows on a regular basis based on the choices you have at the time. So 34 basis points, that's your interest rate risk. But that's not maybe what I'm thinking about doing to money. Maybe I'm going to get a match duration equivalent investment to the loan that I'm thinking about making. When I'm thinking about making a 15 year fixed rate mortgage, maybe be, I could be looking at the 15 year security market for mortgages or which is not that great and so i may be looking at a because of extension risk i mean the problem here the reason why you get paid this uh this um 110 basis points or so 150 basis points is because of option risk because if rates do go up the prepayments will slow and therefore the duration will drift out it'll lengthen that's, the, that's what it means when you have a an extension of credit of interest rate risk so I'm looking at a planned amortization class CMO. Now, if most of you out there sitting around are saying, I'm not going to be doing that, I'm, I'm not going to be buying CMOs, fine. I'm, you can leave here whatever bond you're likely to buy. It's not the best bond ever. It's just what is, where are you as an individual institution likely to stick in your portfolio? And if it's 149 in this case, it was a few weeks ago, that's what I'm looking at. I'm saying, if I don't make the loan, I'm going to buy a bond giving me 149 in the current rate environment right now. There's extension risk here too, people, by the way. But it's something I can live with because I'm comparing it to a 15-year fixed rate mortgage. Okay, so that's that's what I'm looking at in terms of the wholesale equivalent. Now I look over here at credit risk. Now let me mention liquidity and operating expense because most of the rest of the time I'm spending it with you is going to be on a credit risk. I'm going to spend time in, in getting that because that, that's where the COVID deal is. The liquidity risk of a mortgage, you see, in this case, I'm full of liquidity right now. I got liquidity up to yin yang. And, and I'm making a mortgage. It's collateral for the FHLB. I mean, I, I can get access to funding if I need it. I don't have to sell the asset. So, 
in 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 my case, I mean, I, I'm not saying I, I might sell the asset. Probably at least most of my clients, 50 to 75 percent of their production is going uh, back to the secondary market, including FHLB. So that's the way they manage the business and getting the points and uh, getting the income without having to manage the uh, the risk of having a loan in their portfolio. But this is liquidity risk right now. If I'm going to make this loan for my portfolio, is there liquidity risk in that asset? This is an art. I'm going to say no. Okay. Now, if you want to put a liquidity risk factor in here, go for it. It's okay. If, if you're in a situation where you're already borrowed up and you say, you know, I really don't have any more uh, capacity to borrow. And the only thing I can do is, is shrink. And I'm going to have to sell the loan. Then you put a liquidity risk. The bid ass spread is what we're talking about here. So I, I would put something in there right now for a mortgage. I'm not putting anything in. That's my choice. You can differ with me. Fine. As long as you itemize it and say why. The operating cost at the margin. Now, I always say at the margin here. I'm not looking at your 2.5%, 3% costs of operation uh, on average of your institution. I'm not going to capture my average operating costs out of every loan. It's not. You know that. So the, what we're talking about here is... When I make this loan, what is the incremental cost to the institution of making this loan? My servicing cost. Essentially, it's my servicing cost. Now, my servicing cost of a mortgage, I just put a 25 basis points. If you have it serviced for you, it's probably cheaper. If you do it yourself, yes. Eventually, after you do a certain number of loans, you have to hire another person. You have to hire uh, somebody to manage escrows or whatever. And then you can you have to amortize that salary over the expected portfolio they could manage. I don't want to get into uh, incremental cost uh, in here. I'm just I'm just looking at your secondary market and saying I can generally buy servicing for a residential portfolio at 25 basis points. So that's why I stuck in here. Okay, now let me go to the the credit risk and discuss. Discuss the credit risk issue here. And let me, so I'm going to switch my slide here and do this risk assessment for credit risk. Look, I am, normally, if this is a mortgage, some people will even say, I have no, the mortgages that I keep in my portfolio, I haven't had a, an impaired loan, I haven't had a loss, I haven't had a charge off in years, and so I'm going to put zero in. Okay. Fine. You, this is really where historical, uh, uh, when you're, the historical way of doing it, I know there's Cecil people, I guess. Cecil, Cecil is the way in which you do gap accounting relative to the new capital rules. That we're already under. If you're already doing Cecil type of things, fine. It's just that's the, that's the way the market thinks. But many of you are still doing historical A triple L. And and so you're just saying, well, what has my experience been with mortgages? Even though we're now in a COVID world, what's your experience been? So it, it wouldn't be unusual to put 25 basis points to say, well, look, I'm going to cover my butt by saying a traditional. Um, well underwritten, 80% loan to value ratio, uh, you know, 30 30% uh, debt to income, um, 720 plus uh, credit scores, whatever your your uh, your test is for par loans on a, a, and for A credit or B plus credit, that's that's that 25 basis point, and that's how you might be thinking about that. Um, by the way. Uh, I'm not above, I've used the actual screens provided by whether it's uh, the FHLB or Fannie or Freddie or even the secondary, even even uh, that when I was doing running my bank, nobody would do anything with me except Quicken. So I had the Quicken screen up. And they actually showed the par value of the loan and, and how the, the par value, the points differed as you went from uh, lower FICO scores, a higher loan to value ratios, they actually could show you what they would pay you for that mortgage. And so you had a, you had a point rate equivalency there. So if, 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 you're, if you regularly go to a secondary market screen, you'll see what the, what the, uh, the capital markets are considering the factors on credit risk, it's right there and what they're willing to buy the credit for on a, on a daily basis, even under COVID, it's still, there. So 
that will give you some idea of how you may want to think about it. Now, the problem I had as a lender was that while I can argue all day long what the specific loan adjustment for a credit risk should be, I had a regulator that said, Parliament, you, you got a one, well, actually, I had a one and a half percent AAA requirement with three and a half percent capital and your and your impaired loan portfolio, there is no way you're ever going to go below that. These aren't. You're going to maintain one and one, one and a half. They wouldn't even consider anything less than that. And you may be, depending on your history, depending on your relationship, depending on a whole bunch of things, whether you're, you know, whether you're a credit union or what, what kind of institution you are. Let's take 1% as an example. If 1% is required, it's unlikely that you'll be able to reduce your general level of AL as you increase your lending. It's, so I'm assuming that. So if that's the case, I, I'm going to maintain my AL by doing loans. Now, obviously, depending on the client, where your 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 uh, your relative percentage of portfolios are allocated, whether it's uh, consumer or commercial or mortgage, it's going to matter. This is a residential mortgage. So I'm going to say, look, I, I, I'm, I have to maintain my 1%. So I look at my loan portfolio turnover ratio. Often in the past, and even, even Tom and Adam will be surprised at this, I've used duration. I've said, what's the duration of the mortgage I'm making? It's five years. So I will divide my uh, my ex expected AL level, 1%, by five years and come up with 20 basis points additional adjustment. So, because I'm going to have cash flows maturing over those five years. So that became somewhat controversial a little bit because what's the duration and it's going to change. And so, okay, how about this? What's your portfolio ratio? What's your, use your loan portfolio turnover ratio. So if your loan turnover ratio is 25% of your portfolio, depending on the kind of loan we're looking at. If you're making mortgages and you're turning over your mortgages about 25% of your portfolio. If your desired HLL is 1%, then add 25 basis points to the loan factor. That's the way I make the adjustment because you're always having um, charging off loans. I mean, you're always using your allocation. You're always experience law, experiencing loss given to fall. So you've got to maintain that. Well, this is one way. This is kind of like a um, wet your finger is sticking in the air adjustment for at least considering adjusting your HLL as new loans come on the books and old ones go off. Now. Here's where the extra consideration that I want us to talk about. Here's where I want to spend the rest of my time here. What are the additional reserve considerations related to the migration of forbearance loans to delinquent status in the post forbearance period? This is what I'm dealing with with my clients now. I, it, what do I do when, even though the loans I'm making now are to somebody who has a job, where there's uncertainty in the continuation of their ability to do that. What if they do get laid off? What if they are furloughed? furloughed? How, do I, how do I deal with the fact that maybe they'll have to go to forbearance? All the secondary markets, even the FHLB, you know, are they even more generous than secondary markets here? They've made allowances for forbearance. You can go to forbearance. Now, customers, are being informed increasingly that if you do go to forbearance, it may prevent you from going back into the market for a year because your uncertainty of your cash flow. That's a separate issue. The issue is this: if it turns out a loan goes into forbearance, you need forbearance because your teacher is being laid off for the next three months until they get schools back together again, or you're a whatever. It could, it could be anybody who underwrote well who've got the loan and now they have to go into forbearance. This could be somebody that's an existing loan that has to go into forbearance. But I'm thinking about your movement. Now, forbearance has got everybody saying, well, we go to the end of the year, you can go three months, six months. 
I know the FHA will be able to work with you because I've talked to Adam and Tom. Their new program is is considering it, they try to consider more the members, the impact on the member. And so they're trying to design the program that they're putting out there now with member sensitivity. So I know they they're they're thinking about this. But problem I have is what's the regulator doing? What what's the regulator doing? And I'm telling you, the 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 releases I've been looking at and I've been seeing aren't they're saying it's your business. If a loan goes into forbearance, fine. And if it goes into delinquency after it comes back, if it comes in off forbearance, well, what's going to cause it to go delinquent? Well, because forbearance means you got to come back into shape over a year. You got to bring up, make your new payments, make your regular payments, and plus bring your loan back current within a year. What if you can't do that? I don't know anybody who can do that. That's a tough, tough. So what happens if these loans migrate to delinquent status? In the post forbearance period. Then what? They're impaired. That means they're going to require capital. I, mean, I have to give, I have to give some thought that the fact that loans I'm making may in fact progress that way. Now, loans I sell, now I don't have that problem. Once I've sold them, they're off my portfolio, and that's why I'm giving an awful lot of consideration. But I still have to replace cash flows. I still have cash flows that I have to replace on my balance sheet. So I'm going to keep some of this stuff. Which one's up to you? Now, for me to be able to estimate this, I've got to do a little work, people. It's it requires, and I look. It sounds terrible. I got to do vintage and migration analysis on my specific loan types, starting before the pandemic and proceeding through the pandemic. And this requires a special factor adjustment based on the increased impairment of loans due to the impact of the pandemic. You know, I don't know who's going to do that for me? Well, okay, look. If you already have a major accounting firm, you're already on the CISO path, and you already have a CISO-based model, this is all, all this historical data is already in it, and you probably can get some this, this kind of analysis from them. But if you're like me, and you had your two, that's all you had was you. you what you're really doing, if you're going back at least a year, and you're looking at your portfolios quarterly, the, the, the various kinds of uh, mortgage portfolios, I even do this for my commercial and my consumer too. And what I did was I actually put together, I looked at what I originated on a quarter by quarter basis and I tracked them. I said, of the ones I originated, well, unless you're doing co commercial law, it's not too often they go El Dumpo in the first three months, unless it's fraud. But generally, what happened? What, what has been the migration of loans through your delinquency status? What percentage of them went delinquent, and how did they progress through delinquency into uh, uh, actual uh, impairment status? What what's been your record on this? What what's what was the past? Then you move into pandemic, and we haven't seen a lot of delinquencies related to the pandemic yet because we, we're, we're now we're just as an economy wondering what happens to people, and and. and People, look, I know from managing bad credit, I, residential mortgage, I got to keep people in those houses. I can't tell you how many houses, when, when people were evicted uh, and, and they, it was their own home, they uh, took everything with, you know, all the copper, everything. I mean, if you haven't, yeah, managing uh, bad loans is an is a education in itself. But I know I had to keep people in there. Is there lots of ways to do that? Yeah, I mean, I have to admit, as long as they're going to be in paradise, I said, I'm going to do an A and B credit. Um, I, you know, what I'll do is I'll keep them, I'll, I'll, I'll make a, a, a secondary loan, uh, an equity loan, if you will, to help them make the payments and then put the, the, put the actual missed payments on the back end of the loan. Now, it's still impaired. I mean, I'm, I didn't get any better... I didn't get any better credit from the regulator. It's still an impaired loan. I had to do an impairment, and I had to do with the credit allocation based on that. But it kept my home buyer, my customer, in their home. And it was a situation where I could keep it occupied and things like utilities and maintenance, everything was, being, was, was at least there. 
occupancy matters in real estate. Okay. Now, so is it possible for you to be creative with some of these people who might go into forbearance? Is there possibilities that you can adjust their need to come back uh, current? Do you do a, a, a cash out refi and take uh, 15000 and put it into a special or 10000 and put it into a special bank account there as a, as a, uh, as a stress reliever in case there's a, there's a need for forbearance so they can actually come current? They can be forbearance and then come current because that's a pile of money they can use to come current. I mean, there's lots of, but I don't know that the regulator is giving you an agency credit for this. So I've got to do this kind of estimation you see here. So I'm saying, let's say I'm doing 100 million originations and 20% of these loans go into forbearance. I don't know what's happening with your loan check. Maybe you haven't had this kind of exposure yet. Maybe, maybe you haven't had this yet, but it's not unreasonable to expect this kind of migration into forbearance. What about coming out of forbearance? What if 20 20- please submit them at any time through the who are not currently participating? Not <laughs> this is why it's important to fall on the five million equals to figure out. I've written articles on duration. So a 15 year fix I had to do it in a way that I could class CMO. Now if so get into uh incremental adjustment and reserves. Along with this phone, and now they have to go into forbearance. Submits your portfolios, core units, so they can actually come current in the in the model here that I'm looking at. Go back. Oops, wrong one. This way. This adjustment up here, the one percent. That's got to include this special fact right here. Then now, what do I get here? So I add the 1% to the 25 basis points and I get 274. That is not the loan rate. That says, I, that's my marginal yield required to be indifferent between a loan and the investment. Can I get, can I get more than 274 in the market for 15 year fixed rate mortgages? Is it 299, is it three, is it three and a quarter? What can I get? Depends on your market. And of course it depends on some risk factors, but essentially, that's what I'm looking at as being indifferent. If I can get my 274, I'm indifferent between the mortgage and the bond. More than that is great. That's what the market determines. Now, do I want to handle all the risk that goes into the risk factor there? If I don't, that's why I have a that's why I originate and sell. I mean, I know you, you see, you need to be doing these stress testing on your capital because I don't see any regulatory forbearance. You may forbear on your customer. That's great. I don't think the regulator is going to forbear on you. I don't see any evidence of it. I've never experienced regulatory forbearance. The only last time I did was before a lot of you guys were born, back in the late 80s with the thrift industry. And they put it in regulatory accounting in place for about two years, and then they took it all away. And there was a lot of pain, pain when they did. So I don't expect to see regulators give you special conditions for making lend loans in this market. They expect you to manage your capital. So this is where we are, people. And I want you to lend. If you're making mortgages, I want you to consider secondary market. I want you to be able to consider offing the credit, potential credit risk to a, a third party, which would be your FHLB, for instance, which make an allowance for it. But you got to keep some of it because you've got to replace cash flows coming off your portfolio. I would do the same kind of analysis here, what I'm doing, commercial or consumer. A whole bunch of interesting arguments here when I'm doing car loans, whether it's indirect or direct. Because if you've tried to go to an auction lately, like I have with my clients, they're they're like not even operating. I got Hertz dumping, dumping cars on a market that's destroyed the auction market. So anybody that's trying to figure out loss given default on a car loan has got a much bigger nut. Anybody doing leasing is talking about what's the residual value is impacted. So the kinds of things you put in for credit risk is going to be determined by the, the type of loan you're making to who. This was a mortgage that was simple because I know you have some, some um, help here from the FHLB. That's my message today, folks. I'm open for any questions you have. Thank you, Tom. Uh, 
really appreciate the presentation. <clears throat> uh, we, we do have a couple of questions. We have a little time. Um, the first question uh, one of the members had asked uh, about uh, comparing securities to loans when you, when you were going through the pricing uh, segment uh, where you were looking at a, a security uh, as a benchmark. Uh, to uh, b start building your pricing uh, and, and convert and, and uh, building your pricing to uh, come up with a loan price. So, what's your thought process, Tom, behind choosing uh, the right security for comparison? And okay. then, uh, obviously, using a commercial loan or, or a mortgage. A mortgage is easier to uh, figure out. You could use a mortgage-backed security, but mainly like a commercial loan. Right. Th this, um, I have an answer. A little controversy, you might as well, I would have known somebody picked up on this. Look, this match duration equivalent investment is five-year pack CMO. That is an attempt to capture the option risk in the loan itself. If I was gonna be perfect about it, it'd be a 15-year mortgage-backed security that I would stick in here. That may be something somebody would be willing to purchase, so I, I could use that. It's It's really, some people say I should choose a security that's as close as I can to the securitized version of a loan I'm making. And I would agree with that. It's not a problem when it comes to mortgages. When you start doing consumer and mainly commercial, it becomes problematic because the commercial security market is not something an awful lot of community banks or credit unions are familiar with. It's not likely you're going to be buying um, risk adjusted. Uh, commercial paper uh, that, that has duration. So it'd be, a, it'd be a commercial mortgage, for instance, something like that. It's because they're, the insurance companies are involved in this market quite a bit. So what I generally do here, because I'm doing this on an individual institution level, if my institution would not buy that security, I'm only going to put in the security that comes the closest I can to the loan I'm making. If I would buy it, then I'll put it in here. If I wouldn't buy it, there's not, if it's not in my mortgage, if it's not in my loan, in my investment um, policy, if it's something I wouldn't do, then I'm not going to put it here. There's two two types of thought here. One is put the security in that comes the closest to the loan. And my way of thinking is I'm going to put a security in here that I actually would buy because this is for my decision. If I'm not going to buy the uh, investment, then why do I do a loan based on the investment? I'm going to say, well, what, what is my true alternative for making investment? If it turns out you're in a treasury market and that's it, that's all you're doing is doing treasuries, related treasuries. And that's what I'm, then, I'm, then you see my, my break even is a lot different. So that's my, my response. Yeah, I wish it was cleaner than that, Tommy, but, but that's the real response. I'm typically going to say to the institution when I'm talking to them, what, do you, what would you really buy here? And what, what are you buying in this duration? What are you buying in this in the five-year duration area? Are you buying anything? What are you buying here? What are you actually buying? And so I find a lot of people don't do CMO. So I say, well, then what are you, then what are you, are you buying 15-year fixed rates? Or would you buy the security with a little bit of uh, seasoning or are you buying them on the one issue market? What, what are you buying? And I say, let's take that yield. Let's put that in here. Does that help you, Tommy? Yeah, that was, that was good, Tom. Really appreciate that. Uh, one other question uh, we have is uh, pertains to uh, li the liquidity risk premium that you choose. You got into a little bit on the loan level uh, credit premium to choose, um, but um, how uh, how is the liquidity pre risk premium chosen when building your uh, loan rate? Is that a uh, customized or a standard uh, choice? No, it's uh, customized to be made. I mean, it's, yeah, it's customized because I, I'm looking at look, look, look if it's a mortgage. I'm comfortable if I have excess borrowing capacity that I, I won't need to liquidate the loan to generate liquidity. What this really is, is what's the probability that I have to liquidate the loan to generate the cash flow to meet my liquidity needs? And so that's the probability that I'm estimating here. So if I'm going to, if I'm going to liquidate a mortgage, well, if I have to, well, then I'd be looking at what, what's, the par, what's the market value of my collateral. But I can borrow from you guys. So I don't have to sell the loan. I can get, yeah, I'll have a haircut from you guys on a residential mortgage, which is not so bad. But, but that's why I don't consider it to be a liquidity risk for mortgages. It was commercial. 
Well, and then then I've got some some issues. My commercial loans are not liquid, and in some cases I can use them for collateral for you, depending on the kind of collateral. But by and large, I've got to be concerned about that, depending on my overall liquidity. So if I have an overall, if I'm squeezed with overall liquidity, if my if my general institutional liquidity risk is right at the margin of of um, of um, the, my policy, well, I'm going to put a factor in here that considers what I need to do to uh, to borrow to borrow against that that collateral, and and how would I do it, or would I have to liquidate it, and what's to what's to bid ask on that particular asset? That's what liquidity risk really is: the spread between the bid and the ask, uh, depending on the loan itself. At consumer, I'm not too worried uh, because the cash flow is so fast. Even car loans, the, the duration of car loans is 18 months, two years at most. So the cash flow is coming off uh, a, a, a auto portfolio is so fast that I, I, there's no cool liquidity risk. Does that help? Yes, it does, Tom. Uh, is there a range that uh, you generally uh, see uh, with uh, liquidity risk? So say if you have a CNI loan that's not liquid, not pledgeable, what kind of a liquidity risk premium, uh, what kind of ballpark risk premium are you thinking about? Uh, I, I never put in more than 50 basis points. I, I'm never going to put in more than 50 basis points on liquidity risk. It's okay. just it, because it's an institutional wide risk. So I might throw that in, but it'd be, it'd be rare. But if it's a C&I loan, uh, I might throw that in there if I have a big portfolio and I've got to consider that. And a one, one to four family mortgage could be zero to 25, something like that? Yes. Yeah, and, and, uh, but because if I have capacity with you guys, I put zero in because I know I can always borrow again. Correct, okay. Last last question, Tom. Uh, so uh, you showed us how to build out a loan rate and uh, factor in all the uh, risk premiums and servicing and cost to the institution um, and comparable investment rates. So what if, what if uh, when you build a loan, it doesn't the build a loan rate. It's not competitive in the marketplace. What does that tell you to do? What kind of decisions uh, does that lead you to make? If 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 this if I built a loan rate and the break even loan rate was above what I could get in the marketplace, I'm buying a bond. I mean that's that's what I'm doing. Okay, if, if 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 it turns out you're you're uh, making uh, auto loans and you you wind up with an auto loan rate, you see the market says, well, we'll make an auto loan rate at 149 for five year new cars. And I look at my bond and I say, I can't cover my risk. Well, they say, I, I have clients that do this. They say, well, there's no credit risk. These are 800 score customers. These are all 780 or higher. There's no credit risk. There's no liquidity risk. And the operating costs, I already have a big operating portfolio. So uh, there's no marginal cost there. So I, I, I think I can do a big deal doing 150 or 149 auto loans. Wow. Uh, now, I suppose, you know, you might argue there are some conditions under which, you know, 50% of your loan portfolio is auto loans. And you're saying, well, if I don't keep those auto loans flowing, and I, I and, and while I'm gonna, I've got to do a, a mixed portfolio of of A credits and C credit too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make more than I need up on C credits to to cover the break even on the A credits, and I got to be able to do all these to be able to be in the secondary market or to be in the uh, indirect market. Those are the kinds of considerations that go in here, but seldom am I, am I willing to make a new. Uh, originated loan and a loan at a rate that's less than my break-even equivalent risk and cost adjusted to a bond. I wouldn't do it. Okay. Great, Tom. appreciate that. Um, so that's it, Tom. Uh, thank you very much. We're at the uh, end of our segment here. Uh, we're approaching 12 o'clock. Thanks again. Um, if anyone has any questions, by the way, uh, and you wanted to ask uh, Tom offline, you could always um, I believe Tom's contact information is there on the on the um, presentation. We'll be sending a copy of the presentation out to everyone, by the way, um, uh, in, a, in a day or so. Um, and that concludes our session for today. Next week, uh, I'm sorry, in two weeks, we're going to have our next webinar in the series. That's, that's Thursday, July 23rd at 11 a.m., same time. Our topic is going to be on deposit pricing, how to optimize deposit pricing to drive bottom line earnings while retaining franchise value. So the presentation will be conducted by Tom's colleague, Janet Lockwood, also a, a wonderful presenter, a lot, great information she provides to us for those who have 
um, attended the uh, strategy session, the strategic financial planning workshop. Um, she has very uh, valuable information and that um, you'd be compelled to uh, attend this session to, to learn more about. So um, Janet Lockwood, Thursday morning, uh, July 23rd, please attend our next webinar. Great topic on uh, deposit pricing. So that concludes our session for today. And again, I want to thank Tom. I appreciate you joining us today. And I'll see you all soon. Thank you very much.